In the third chapter of the Epistle of St. James, we have further lights on something that I addressed in the beginning. First of all, in chapter 3, he goes on about the responsibility that we bear as those who have the ministry of the word, teachers. Only a few of you, my brothers, should be teachers, bearing in mind that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Now, I mentioned this morning how in exorcism had appeared the fact that the demons were using the mouthpiece of those who had influence so as to sow discord, what we call dharma, zizania, these tears, these weeds, and confusion comes as a result. But it's all because of the power of this muscle here. This is a hugely powerful muscle. And when one thinks about human history, ideas have changed history. What is Marx? What was Hitler? But there were thoughts worked into action which devastated millions and millions of lives. Words coming from thoughts. Words then go into other people's minds and then they work on their minds in turn. By a capillary effect, our words have resonance. And by, of course, modern means of diffusion, they can have even greater effect. Of course, we have in our day a capacity also for access to a great number of people by modern means, which an ordinary priest would not have had only 50 years ago. The B side is that everyone has the same power, and therefore we are up against a huge barrage of resistance. And whereas maybe 100 and 150 years ago, people had a greater receptivity to the spoken word than now, and also to the written word, because they were not so satiated uh, with a large number of words coming at them. Now we are up against the fact that actually people do not listen much compared with about 100 150 years ago. I've heard this from others that in Wales, where I was brought up, when life was simple, there were two sources of natural recreation in a dull world. In the country areas, they would come together now and again and they would have homemade fun, but it was actually quite clever. A natural talent would come out of that. People had a gift of amusing each other by the word and so on. In fact, my brother, who is head of the Welsh television, he, when he had, when he was younger, reserved to himself one sector. It was public enter light entertainment, because he said it was the most difficult. And he went around Wales and he would fish out local talent who still had it. And he put them on screen. And uh, it was healthy, clean fun. The gift of communication. And of course we have to cultivate that as well. I mentioned because you had missed uh, the lecture there that it's receivable again on YouTube. Well, I have a whole channel of programs just for children. Just for children. Uh, uh, if you go into the website, uh, onto the YouTube channel with my name. In fact, one of the playlists would be Little People. And it's all for children. There are over a hundred little programs for children. They're puppets who talk. But you see, these are getting into the agora of communication and presence where souls are. All ages, because the children are there. All ages are there. And it's what Benedict XVI was asking for. In our terms, it would be, if you can't beat them, join them. In other words, get in there. And don't let the devil have the monopoly of these neutral stages. They're very powerful. And you'd be amazed at the number of people who actually come in. Because YouTube, it's everywhere. Darkest Africa, India. It's all the same, especially in English. And you get thousands and thousands of people watching these things. So that's what is at our fingertips. And that's something that precisely the Holy Spirit was perhaps 
putting on the hearts of those who started to create things like EWTN, where you couldn't have Angelica. She had just faith. And the stories that come out of that, the way that that started, it's unbelievable actually. I can just tell you one, just to illustrate the point, showing that the Lord actually wanted it to happen, so as to use these modern means. She had to get very large and extremely expensive discs, satellite things, so that this could be broadcast around. And therefore it was huge, big, 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 big money. And therefore she only had one means, it was adoration and prayer, and with a certain insistence. So there she was, and all her sisters, praying like these sisters here in adoration, better adoration. And she had faith, because the Lord wanted it, she believed. And eventually, she had, had to order these gigantic things. She had to get the thing moving. And this gentleman came with this huge load of massive things, which had to be set up, and of course, big money. But he had one condition from his top man, he was not to go away until the sign, the ch this check had been signed for the big, 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 big money that had to be paid. So there she was, Mother Angelica. And then she, there's only one other thing I do here, uh, wait here a minute now, she prayed into the chapel and pulled hard on the Lord for the Blessed Sacrament. So anyway, she came out and then he was still there. Obviously still there, he wasn't <laughs> going away. Uh, and then, anyway, to cut a long story short, uh, the money just wasn't there. Um, and then, this other nun came running out, Mother, could you please come here, there's a the phone call, it might be important. And she replied, well, I'm talking to a gentleman right now, can you send a ring back? He says, he'll hold until you're ready. So it's okay, then. okay, well, if you excuse me for a minute, I'll go and see what this phone call is. So in she went. And it was this gentleman, Well, Mother, I'm floating from a yacht in the Caribbean. Uh, something put on my heart. Uh, you might need uh, something uh, uh, in the way of money right now because you're doing good work. Uh, well, actually, that would be of interest at the present moment. Uh, what could you afford? Uh, well, I'm just to tell me what you need. So she told me exactly <laughs> the sum. And uh, then eventually, now could you give me your, your coefficient of actually the bank credit? And so, okay, I'll get on to my bars, I'm on this level of bars. Well, from his yacht in the Caribbean, he immediately got to the bank, and the man wasn't going away until he could verify that was the case. So he got onto his bars, and they looked into the computer, yes, this is exact, Carl has come, Sun has come through. So off you went with this happened. It was all done. Because the Lord wanted it to happen, he's in charge. But look at the millions of people that this has actually touched. And in Ireland, until that happened, you only had basically RTE, that's your Irish BBC, and it's gone down, 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 and it's gone actually quite anti Catholic in some even though they've done some stuff for me. It's the bottom line that there's an agenda there which is quite sinister. And it's not like that with the BBC, at least as far as I can make out. The BBC is neutral. Uh, and certainly the Welsh television is certainly not like that, because it's very much pro Christian. Uh, because they focus on us to on, on, on the Rosh Hashanah, and it's, it's very good. I mean, they're, they're very balanced. But the RTE is a, something they're trying to get at the Catholic Church, and they're actually succeeding because that's all the people are hearing, mm -hmm. and respectable people. Uh, now, EWTN has actually balanced that out because you go into a Catholic home now, and lots of them have EWTN on when you go in, and it's good stuff. Good stuff. They're getting good teaching. So that's providence. So in other words. That's using what is out there as the modern pulpit. And also we have means now, even at home, of producing things ourselves and getting them in some way circulated professionally. We are usually, ourselves or people with us can do things which are of a professional nature and get them diffused. So therefore, we have not less but more that we can do in the realm of this ministry of the word. There where people are at. Now, he goes on with regard to the harm that can be done also with regard to the word. Someone who does not trip up in speech has reached perfection and is able to keep the whole body on a tight rein. Now, with regard to speech, 
It is the one sector that sometimes people who have great mastery of themselves don't quite get mastery. I remember I mentioned how bit by bit internet had come in to our monastery at the same period it was coming into others really, it was the same revolution. And also how bit by bit it came from just the scriptorium into the cells. Well then when things started to happen, because there was not the same control over who had access to it, it was just available, well I noticed what was going on. You found that people who tendentially would have been inclined to spend a lot of time in prayer were diminishing that time. Where was the time going? Well, there was so much interesting stuff that could be done for the Lord on these machines and so on that without realizing it, 10 minutes was becoming half an hour, half an hour was becoming an hour, an hour was becoming two hours, two hours was becoming three hours, and then when it came to the time for what should have been half an hour before Vespers of Meditation and Adoration, well, where were they? And this is the kind of thing that would go on, last minute coming there, not realizing where time was going, because time does not exist on the computer. And also, we we'll notice other things happening. They were very good at doing things like this, like producing pamphlets or whatever it might be. And of course, that takes time. And then they kind of perfect, they want to get these right, but a little bit of extra time, I want to finish, I want to finish, I want to finish. And so, something goes wrong. And it was actually almost amusing. You go along some of these monastic cloisters and they're away, uh, typing away at the, and then something is going wrong in there. And you think temperatures rising and these holy monks, you see, changing gear and gradually becoming more volcanic and the interesting syllables coming out of their concentration. It's very interesting, you see. They're losing control! And it's the first thing to go is the tongue. We're losing merit just by the same instrument as maybe that same night we'll be consecrating the sacred host, when it should not be the case. It's the same instrument that is making these bad noises and good noises that we have to be careful because we sometimes excuse ourselves for the odd slip of the word, but they're all heard, and people also hear them. So again, complete control. And actually, I noticed just going around the ecclesiastical world, that things are handled in a different way in different cultures. I mentioned how the French stroke Italian one is pretty, <clears throat> uh, should we say, heated. Uh, <laughs> the actions are quite immediate sometimes, especially at a certain level. But in other cultures it's a bit more calm, and they actually handle it in quite a different way. I've noticed that in Britain things are handled, but actually in a more powerful way without getting to that point. Just the power of the word, actually, on its own, well chiseled and aimed. It's far more clever. And also humour. Uh, whereas in some countries, uh, humour is very noisy. In the British culture, it's not at all, and you don't actually laugh. Uh, you get someone else to chuckle, but you don't. And it's all just the power of the word. I, maybe it might be that one in German Holland as well, I don't know. But it's certainly not the same as the boisterous way that you might find in some countries. But again, the word, cultivated and mastered. And in Britain, I noticed that that is something which also in the Benedictine world in the British Isles, which is very important where we are, because they're very important as a presence. As you know, Cardinal Hume became the head of the church. Uh, he was a good example of someone like that. What they have is a whole ethos of dignity in their comportment. It's part of the gentlemanliness which actually is to be cultivated by any priest. That one is always a certain niche, but one doesn't, without losing that closeness to the people, one does not lose what one is. And commanding respect by that element of being able to dialogue with anyone about anything on their level without losing one's own dignity. And it can be done. It can be cultivated. And the great way of getting through to anyone of any sort is the gift precisely of a cultivated wit. Because that opens the door of the heart. And it's not difficult, but it does make a difference. I noticed that with my spiritual father, who was a Benedictine. He was very good at that. He could get through to anyone, even though he was from a great family. But he had this element of finding the word that would make them chuckle. And of course, he got them straight away. 
But that's to be cultivated as priests. We have to be people able to navigate in any atmosphere and get in there. Now, someone who does not trip up in speech has reached perfection and is able to keep the whole body on a tight rein. Once we put a bit in the horse's mouth to make it do what we want, we have the whole animal under our control. Or think of ships and so on, the rudder. And then he goes on here. So the tongue is only a tiny part of the body, but its boasts are great. Think how small a flame can set fire to a huge forest. The tongue is a flame too. Among all parts of the body, the tongue is a whole wicked world. It infects the whole body, catching fire itself from hell. The head of it. it says forth, it says fire to the whole wheel of creation. Now, in Ireland, we have a social problem which is very ancient. It's family feuds, often to do with land, but. There are families, sides of families who don't talk and so on. It's been there for a long time. It's also, we have another problem. It's the large number of what we call travelling people, itinerants. They're kind of the Irish equivalent of gypsies. And these people also have feuds and arguments and chunks of that family don't talk to chunks of that. So it's like that. And they may be in the same church. And it's very sad. And this block of silence is the way that they handle it. We do not talk to that group of people. Well, this kind of thing, it's very sad when you think about Christian civilizations, that can still be there. Now, with regard to going through life, there are no winners in these kind of battles. Everyone is losing. We have to teach our people the importance of not contaminating their soul and therefore their whole existence on earth with things which are of less importance than the interior life. What is, e.g., property or gaining a point in an argument compared with peace on the inside? Now, true value, true victory is on the level of charity and merit. And if we can somehow educate our people to have a supernatural vision of things, one can heal both relationships and also give people joy of heart. There is no joy in unforgiveness. I remember hearing this from a big charismatic one day when I was a student. He was a great uh, speaker and he had great gifts of healing and so on. And he was giving this talk to students and he mentioned how one time he was praying with a lady who had he wasn't, she wasn't well, and when he was praying over her, he had this clear knowledge called the gift of knowledge, called la science, and he could see very clearly that there was in this person an issue of unforgiveness. And he, he said to us, I saw it, I had this knowledge more clear than any, any other case I've ever had of a similar type. He knew this was the case. And he asked the lady, is there anything like that? And immediately she, she yes, she said there was. It was that she'd lost her husband in the war, a young man, and he would always be so precious to her that she could never ever forget the Germans who had killed him. Mm -hmm. And he tried to speak to her, look, there's no point in hanging on to this, what good is it between you? And she just, every time he tried to push this, no, never forget the Germans, forgive them, never. So he had to back down. He could not carry on playing with her or remove the others. There was just no way he knew she was herself blocking. She was blocking what? This psychosomatic effect of being a whole person, that the bitterness of the mind, the will, the heart, was hardening the whole system and the person. And the body too was being embittered and could not be healed. Now, we had to go away, of course, but by chance, Sometime later, maybe a year or two later, he came back to the same assembly and found this lady by then in a wheelchair. And he knew exactly why. Unforgiveness, never handled. And people are going through life, even within the same family, with unforgiveness 
never handled. And if the Lord gave that prayer until we die, for every time we recite the Lord's own prayer, this clause, this conditional clause, as we forgive those who trespass against us, there's a reason for it. He knew how profound this issue was going to be in humankind until the end of time. And therefore, every time we have that, we're reminded. And it's not difficult to, by the act of will, to say, I let go. I let go. That is forgiveness. At least by an act of will, one is no longer voluntarily holding on to it, because there's an aggression holding on to it. I want that person's harm, envy, jealousy, hatred. Having said that, one hears from people, well, I forgive, but I can't forget. Well, that's a different issue slightly. Already the act of forgiving takes away that bitterness. The problem is that psychologically we can't really actually obliterate a past event. It's there. But one can readjust the mental attitude towards it. And okay, as long as we're trying to do that, then we can proceed and give willingly absolution, asking for help for the Lord to do the rest of the work. But it's that fundamental saying, I let go, which is the beginning of forgiveness. And, of course, in our daily life, depending on our situation, but we all have to handle unpleasant events, and people are unpleasant to us. We have to be careful how we react to them. Never react immediately. Take a step back. I had a very interesting case, actually, just while I was here, I think. I had a text, because I opened it at the end of the day, and um, it was from a person who had been very, very, very badly upset by an attack. A verbal attack from a person of prayer. This person, the people in the same prayer group. And then, sometime later, just as you know, it was, this phone call came back with an apology from the other person. In other words, the person himself, she hadn't reacted at all, she'd just taken it. But the other person had been worked upon by grace and realized. So maybe she'd prayed for him, I don't know, but that's the way. Had she reacted, of course, that's two explosions. But in the same way, the truth has a way of defending itself. And if people raise their voice, it's not a good sign. A calm possession of the truth in serenity and self-control is far more convincing than raising the voice. And often wins better in the end. So we never lose our dignity. But it's important that we do not ruin our lives by bad turns from other people. Because, after all, these people who cause pain are themselves, even though they don't know it, causing their own pain. Every time one causes pain, one is causing pain to one's own soul. So these people are suffering, they're in pain, spiritually. And people who go around hurting other people are very sad people. In that way, if we're not too affected by this, and it shows that we're able somehow to have a supernatural vision of things. The correct attitude towards people of this nature, we want a compassion rather than anything else. They're suffering. But if we do the Lord's work, unfortunately we find that another type of attack comes, that the demon does not like certain things to be said, or done, or whatever, and so he'll use people who are weak to get at us. They will be his instruments to get at us. And that will happen a lot. We're very much attacked by certain people sometimes if we try to be faithful to certain things. It's difficult, but just be aware that we are under threat from the enemy of the sacred, ourselves, if we try to defend it. Now, Wild animals and birds, reptiles and fish of every kind can all be tamed and have been tamed by humans, but nobody can tame the tongue. It is a pest that will not keep still for a deadly poison. The poison that can come from a word is something else. In, I mentioned the traveling community, they have particular ways of behaving. They're usually fairly primitive. And one thing they do when they get into this kind of thing is calling names, name calling. It's not very really nice, but it's a very low form of bad dialogue. But for us it would be more sophisticated perhaps.
but we can do it in our own way, e.g. revealing such and such a thing about somebody else. In moral theology, we learned that if someone else calumniates us, takes away our reputation unjustly and says things which aren't true, then that actually allows us, while discussing the issue, to explain something about the other person which would explain why he is doing that. In other words, they have taken away unjustly our name. So in that situation, there is an element of equilibrium in showing that the whole story is thus. And therefore, one might have to, in a just equilibrium of the situation, indicate certain things about the other person. It's not the same as gratuitous calumniating, but also if one is, for instance, handling a vocation or whatever it might be, or promoting somebody, one has to know exactly the for and against. But casual telling of stories about somebody is something that we need to be careful of, even in the ecclesiastical world. We use it to bless the Lord and Father, but we also use it to curse people who are made in God's image. Again, this sacred organ, it's important that it be totally given to the one that has consecrated it to him. Only our tongue can say those sacramental formulae. Therefore, at certain times of our being, they belong to heaven. They are Christ's. And therefore, there has to be this continuum in all our deportment. But nothing undignified or unworthy of those consecratory uh, or absolving words should enter into our mode of operation of the tongue. There is that whole devotion in Protestantism to it's a biblical expression, a clean tongue in Welsh, where this be a, a pure lip, only uttering good things. And actually, when, I don't know what it's like in Holland, but when, in Wales where I was brought up, the Protestants are very careful about never using swear words or bad words. It's very grave for them, because it's biblical. And we must have the same devotion ourselves to the purity of our tongue, especially as consecrated people. The blessing and curse come out of the same mouth. Now, unfortunately, because of my situation in Ireland, I get a lot of people coming to me for prayer and so on, but those, a lot of them who come from the family community come for one issue. They want a curse removed. It's something that happens a lot in this particular group of people, that they believe in God, but in a rather strange way sometimes, and one weapon they have is to launch a curse. And it leads to things going wrong, going wrong, going wrong, going wrong, going wrong. What they call bad luck. But it works, because somebody somewhere has invoked demonic powers. And he loves to come in. He loves to be invited. So they're not just words. And uh, so a priest, of course, can break it, and he will break it. Um, only a priest really can do that, but it has to be broken. These curses are real things, unfortunately. They're not just flat or scorches. Anything which engages an energy of that nature, satanic, is unfortunately something, a real force for harm. As are our blessings real forces for good, we need to realize all we have. I remember when in Rome, I was looking for a while in an American college, uh, it was the missionary college there of the Americans, uh, Mary Lowe in Rome, so it was a place to stay basically, and there were lovely people, and the procurator general of their congregation was also the rector of the house, and he was a good, holy missionary all, all his life to Africa. He's gone back now to Africa to die there. He wants to die with those people in Africa, a uh, good American. And he would come out with things at table or during the homily. And one homily, he said this, we priests do not realize what we have. One day, we in his village in Africa, this lady came up to him with a child who was obviously about to die. There's not much medicine out there, you just accept the will of God. So maybe just one last blessing from Father. So, pray quietly over this child, give his blessing with all his force. And he just concluded, now that child is a healthy young man. In other words, 
the power of the blessing of the priest is the power of Christ's own blessing. And therefore, it has power of healing as well. So we must not must un underestimate the fact that we are, in some way, a Trinitarian presence, that we have not just power to concentrate, but we have the power, the force of Christ on earth to do what he was doing. He did commission his disciples to go around and do good with all these things. Gifts are not explored, because Christ if is in us. If we have faith, if we believe certainly and surely, then he will take us down earth if it is his will. That's always the bottom line, if it is his will. But we must not be afraid to pray with people. And the very fact of taking them seriously is a help to them. Someone cares. Someone loves me. My brothers, this must be wrong. Does any water supply give a flow of fresh water and salt water out of the same pipe? It's very sad when one sees a priest losing his temper and swearing and all that kind of thing. Or even actually when a priest sits down calmly before a film which is going to be in practice pornographic at a certain point. That's something also to be looked at because it's the same Lord who is Lord of our time and all our organs, all our senses, all five of them. The eyes, therefore, are channels of input as the tongue is a channel of output. So we're taking in through that channel things which are going to remain in there also and damage us. And also the ruling of our time by the Lord of our time, who is Lord of our priesthood, and we are remember his presence on earth, therefore our time is consecrated, is important. We don't just switch off at the end of the day and forget that we're still priests. It's better if one has some kind of relaxation in God finding it in things which don't involve something outside the Christian sphere, like television, which eventually is probably going to be contaminated. Because there's a big difference between live television, when we can see anything coming at us without warning, and something which is filtered, e.g. a DVD, we know exactly what's on it. Uh, or something, God, it means it was, yeah, of course, that's quite neutral, it's about to be good. But also, in some monasteries, they would have television introduced, but never live. And therefore, somebody would know exactly what this program will contain, and it's safe. In other words, we have to be careful, because live television is dangerous. Something can become just like that and devastate our interior. It's not bad to have awareness of what's going on through the news, but the secret is to know how to turn it off afterwards. Can a fig tree yield olives, my brother, or a vine yield figs? No more can sea water yield fresh water. As I was saying before, out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. Now if we're filling our minds not with more of the profane, but with just that continual input of holy things, and the time spent with God and his angels, that's what will overflow from us. We are what we take in. Dis-moi qui tu entres, et je te dirai qui tu es. Tell me who you hold, who you hang around with, and I'll tell you who you are. Whilst Moses is real on the soul. Now, I just want to conclude this little reflection with this element that we resemble who we serve. People out there, if one looks, now, I was looking one day at some footage of the 60s on DVD. It was when the Beatles were at their height, and I just happened to notice the clothes at that time. These were the young people at the time, but actually it was quite tidy. Uh, they were modern, but they were tidy. Now, this is now 2014, and those same young people who would be dancing in the equivalent of those things now, they are not tidy and often they are deliberately ugly. Now, they're imitating something. What are they imitating? There's a defigurement of the beauty of God, and it's deliberate. It's a refusal of order. Now, this is quite sinister, and I see young people now also often covered in bits of tattoo and things, and it's quite ugly what is going on. And these are nice, good-looking young people, deliberately wanting to be ugly. Now, they're imitating something sinister, and not aware of it. So, it's very dangerous, and there was a case I had, I didn't know him personally, but I got to know parts of his family, 
because he had over him strange tattoos and they seemed to be invitations basically to Satan or whatever, I don't know what they were, there was something very spooky about these tattoos all over him. He ended up losing his temper at home and got into an argument with his wife and started to hit her and got hold of some kind of weapon and eventually bashed her to death. So a few days later the children came to me and that had to be handled. Of course he's now in prison. But you see, all this question of putting things on your arm, it's not indifferent either. They're open invitations if they're not good. So just for people to be aware that the devil is actually around and he's having an open day because no one knows that he's there and how much they're opening him themselves to him. All these things open the soul. And actually, if one looks carefully at what is going on in the modern recreation of the discos, the whole of the event is towards lowering, lowering the barriers, the defences, and entering into a mode of losing self-control and of indulging in the lowest. Now basically, that is extremely dangerous for any immortal soul. Now, that is the young people involved massively in the culture of recreation, and they count it as odd people out if they won't go. Well, that's what we're up against in youth ministry. We have to be very much aware of all this, and explaining to them as adults the preciousness of their immortal soul. If one dialogues with them as adult to adult, and not as talking down to them as children, there's a chance that one can realize that they themselves have to be responsible, because there's only one life. And some things are too precious to be given away too quickly. And they also need to be aware that it does not lead to happiness to enter into relationships which do not have depth or lasting history. It leads to great pain. And it leads to depression and by now easily suicide. I'll just finish with this. Recently I was talking to a friend, well, he's not a friend of mine, I know him now, because he came to me. He'd be a middle-aged person who had been in prison, in fact, had been in prison or some kind of institution of, of correction most of his life. And he was in one of the big prisons there in Ireland. And in that prison had been a series of suicides inside the prison. And one night he was there in his cell and he heard this voice. And it was a voice inviting him to do the same and how to do it or whatever. And he remembered these other ones. And he asked this voice, because it was an objective voice, and it was not just a voice, but it was actually something, it was succeeding in creating a, a cushion of bliss, as it were, false bliss, enticing towards committing this act. Get out of this sentence quickly. So, because somebody in prison, I believe from the IRN, had warned him about this question of suicide, if he comes to you as well, resist. He actually started to address this strange presence and said, are you the one behind these others who committed suicide, the one who pushed them to it? And this, and he, he described the voice, it was an objective voice and a nasty voice a sinister voice, he said, yes! And so he started to realize what was going on. And when he discovered what presence he was dealing with, he more or less gave this message to it. Come back in an hour, I'll think about it. So for the time being, the thing went away. And then something strange happened. For the first time in his life, he turned to God. He went down on his knees, he even asked what was up. Yeah. And he was given a supernatural grace. He had an instant flash of infused knowledge of the faith, the Catholic faith, just like that. And I heard this from a person who comes, this other bit about it, from a person who comes to me every morning, because have was at some talk of people who come to the public, it's a public one in the Hermitage. This person comes every morning, and he said to me, his, brother, his own brother's a priest, the person who comes in the morning, his brother's a priest, Capuchin, 
and he overheard this conversation going on in Dublin. It was a conversation between this man I'm talking about who's now out of prison, and somebody who was asking questions of theology or whatever. And this priest, who was just listening to all this, noticed this common, uneducated man, each time he's giving a theologically perfectly accurate answer to these difficult questions. He couldn't have got that from himself. So he made an appointment or somehow found him out, I want to talk to you, and he wanted a story. That's how it was. He'd been given in prison an infused grace, the fullness of faith. He who a few seconds earlier had heard his voice. Yeah.